Hi everyone, uh, I hope everyone's well and safe at home. For our second creator chat, we've got someone I'm really excited to talk to, who also had a very successful Kickstarter just recently that just closed. Uh, so good morning, Ryan. Thank you for joining us. That's all right. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Uh, so um, where are you at the moment? And um, yeah, are you working from home or well, well, what's your situation? Yeah, yeah. I'm um, outside of writing comics. I'm a teacher. So I'm currently on school holidays. So uh, the term will be going back as remote teaching as well. So I am bunkered down in my office, which is normally uh, just the, the comic writing office, but will now be also my teaching bunker too. Yes. So are you in New South Wales or? Uh, the ACT. ACT, right. Because in Victoria, uh, they already started the term this week. So um, I have a nine-year-old kid. So, you know, mm -hmm. we've already started that remote learning kind of thing. They're, they're sending us tasks um, every day and, um, and things like that. So yeah, there's always one of us at home. Um, thankfully yeah it's they, very different it's very new um, I've got I've got uh, school-aged children as well so I'm sort of seeing it from both sides um, but as an educator I'm certainly excited at the opportunities for some innovation that we have so I'm trying to see the positive side of it that's good I like that <laughs> uh, uh, see uh, um, um, I'm at libraries now but I used to be a teacher as well so I was a teacher yeah. for a few years um, I like that you're trying to see the positive because my first reaction was like, oh my God, <laughs> for teachers, you know, that there's no holidays for you guys. You just need to prepare now for this. It's just, it's so unknown and yeah. it's, there, there is the opportunity to do it in different ways. And thankfully in the ACT, we're being quite well supported in yeah. how we're going to do it. And um, uh, I, I run ICT at my school. So I yeah. certainly, before shutdown occurred, I had vision of what I sort of wanted and how we could do it. And always just trying to take into account the three, you know, we call the three stakeholders, which is us, the parent and the student, and get us all into this triangle of efficiency. And uh, we did the last two weeks of term um, fairly well. So uh, we start, we still have another week after this of holidays, and then we go back and um, I'm certainly fairly well prepared for it. And um, my class were already in the swing of things. So fingers crossed and we'll see how long it takes. <laughs> that's awesome. That, that, that's awesome. That's really good to hear. Um, yeah. Now, uh, so you're a comic book writer and you're also a teacher. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Do your kids know? Sometimes. Yeah, they do. Um, they don't read a lot of my work because a lot of my work is certainly not for them. Um, every now and then one will come up and say, oh, you know, my parent bought me negative space. And I'm like, that's a, that's a pretty adult book full of adult <laughs> concepts and words. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I noticed. And I'm like, well, I didn't buy it for you. So that's, that's your parents' fault. Um, <laughs> but um, they're, they're certainly aware. And I have a few all ages things that, that they can check out. But on the whole, they just sort of go, oh, right, it's going, so that's really cool. And then they don't really know too much. And I sort of just say, hey, look, don't Google me. We're all good. <laughs> well, I guess it's up to the parents to decide you know yeah. but oh, cheers i've got some parents that read my stuff which is kind of cool yeah oh that's cool yeah. yeah that's pretty cool so i imagine you're probably really busy uh, preparing for the term and all that well but um yeah i'm sort of trying to fit the work in each day but also take some time to so and and still get there i've still got um stuff to write as well so the, the usual juggle of, of meeting all the all the roles and hats that we wear in a day. And uh, yeah, um, so um, comic book writer, teacher. Is there any other odd job that you've done? You know that you would uh, uh, mention, like for example, full disclosure uh, and something um, something odd. Um, because you know my background is in media studies and teaching before okay. libraries, but I had an odd job where uh, for a year I was in the UK uh, cleaning operating theaters after surgery. Oh wow! Yeah, that's nuts. 
uh, that was pretty nuts, actually. Like most of the time, it was okay, but sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, I did go into the uh, into the operating theater and thought, like, what the hell happened here? Because there was blood everywhere. Imagine. Yeah, just try to piece it together in your head. Be like, oh, I wonder what I'm dealing with here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's pretty wild. So, any um, other jobs in your? I started teaching when I was 21, so. Um, I've been doing it a long time and I've sort of stayed the course and I've done um, casual teaching and I've done assistant principal work and I've done classroom teaching and I've done IT. Yeah. Um, before then, I mean, I'd worked in uh, restaurants. So I was a great dishwasher. I loved the mindless monotony of dishwashing. Um, I've worked in metal factories, used to do a lot of you know, sawing and bending and linishing of metal and welding and stuff like that. Um, I've worked on roofs uh, for a brief period uh, in, in the Queensland sun, which I wasn't a huge fan of. Um, I've done tutoring, I've gone cotton picking, uh, no, cotton chipping, sorry, way out in Colorado, Bryce. So um, I've sort of bounced around with odd jobs, but once I fell into teaching, um, I was pretty keen on doing that and then using that as a day job to then leverage against the, the night job of writing. And so I've written um, mostly comics and that's certainly the, the medium I have the most passion for and like writing the most, but I've also written um, like some short stories that have, have been published here and there. And I've written, um, I used to write reviews and I used to write like articles and I even edited and wrote a book of essays about um, Daredevil, which was published by SEPA, a publisher in the States. Yeah. Uh, do, do you feel like, uh, you know, having those kind of experiences and different jobs add to the writing or have you ever used them for the writing? I definitely think there's an element of it's good to, it's good to branch out and grow experiences when when you want to write. I've, I've often been pretty open about the fact that I, I wrote for a long time, but it was when I met my wife and we got married and we started a family that my writing got better. And I think it's because I had more to write about instead of just being a, a young lad in his twenties, being a bit of a lout and just teaching, um, which is fairly, fairly boxed in as far as life experience goes. Um, experiencing new emotions and having new connections and, and, and building greater empathy and all those sorts of things. That, and I think that writing, I mean, story is all about character for me and it's all about character arc and how a character can change. And so usually if you're dealing with a character's change, you're dealing with their foundational beliefs or their um, emotional skill set or their viewpoint on the world. And so the more you've gone through that, the more you can take the character through that. Yeah. So I firmly believe the more you can do in, in the world, the more you can experience, uh, the, the better your writing will become. Yeah, yeah, th that's my thinking as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I will like uh, what you say there, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned that you uh, wrote also reviews. Uh, I think you wrote reviews for uh, CBR for a while. And, yeah, then, yeah. and then you, uh, you had the weekly crisis as well. Um, is that still going? No, the weekly crisis, I think the site is completely possibly shuttered now, or at least yeah. it's, it's certainly not active. Um, yeah. yeah, I started writing there 12 years ago, maybe. Yeah. Um, and it was awesome. It was just really like I was writing about comics on my own sort of site anyway. as just a way to analyze and to share things that I enjoyed. Um, and through that sort of got picked up by them. And it was nice to just write, you know, different articles or takes or lists or whatever and just sort of analyzing stuff that I would sort of dig into. And then that gig got me the opportunity to write uh, on the review team for CBR. And that was about 10 years ago. And that was a fun, cool little paid opportunity. Um, probably not the most passionate writing gig I ever had in that they're, 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 they're short reviews. Um, they're sort of, they're, they're great to read. I used to read the CBR reviews all the time back when they, they, they did them. I'm not sure if they still do now that they're under new ownership. But they're little pocket reviews and they're great. Um, I would prefer to write like 3,000 words on something, but that wasn't the job. And, and it was kind of, you could turn it over in like a night or two, which was kind of interesting. Um, but I did enjoy that. And then um, I, try to, I try to find opportunities to do stuff that still keeps me writing in that vein, whether it's writing on my site or whether it's writing like back matter in my comics. I know um, for Beautiful Canvas, a mini series I did with Sammy Cavella, uh, through Black Mask Studios, we had a back matter essay in each issue where myself and the editor, a good friend of mine, Dan Hill, we would take uh, like a, a, a thing, whether it was a creator or whether it was a piece of work, and we would just break it down between us. I love doing stuff like that. So I've still tried to keep a toe in that 
where I, I wrote for a magazine called Crime Factory a handful of times, uh, many years ago while it was still active. Um, there's another magazine that I'm, I'm just uh, back and forthing on a submission with them. Um, it's just another itch to scratch, I think. I just, I like writing and if there's not a deadline due, I'll just kind of find or make something to write anyway. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. And uh, and I, as a reader, I really love having that kind of back matter as well, you know, mm. having, uh, you know, some essays or some writing or, you know, when writers also talk about their influences or anything like that, I, I always really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, me too. One question about that. So uh, can you turn off the reviewer and the creator to just enjoy within a comic or, or is that impossible? Sometimes I'm pretty good at doing it where I, I'm the kind of guy that doesn't see twists coming in a movie purely because I never try to find them, if that makes sense. Like normally if I'm just sitting there watching a movie, I'm just like, oh, cool. And I just go along for the ride and I kind of do switch it off unless it starts to go bad. And then I'm like, then I start to like pick it apart. Like, why did they do that? Why did they do that? Why did they do that? But if it's a really cool movie, like I saw Knives Out um, at the end of last year, yeah. I tried not to play the game in my head of who is it, who is it, who is it, because it's, it, I like it just enjoying each scene and more just seeing how it's constructed scene by scene and how the characters are sort of plotted against each other instead of trying to like too um, expertly look for clues. Mm. So I can sort of switch that off. But sometimes, especially with comics, I'll sit down and read it. And if it's really good, like I was just reading last night, um, City of Glass, the yep. Paul Oster um, adaptation by Mazzuchelli and I'm reading it and it's so smart in the way that it's paneled out and the way they use balloons and tails and things that I was I was reading it slowly and I was rereading parts and it was probably taking me a little out of the story but it's such a, a, a work to be deconstructed that I think it was almost intentional mm. that you would read it in that way and yeah. so in that instance I'm like part of me is reviewing it but part of my brain is like oh what can I like what can I steal from this or be informed by or like take into my own practice? So um, I sort of find a balance between the two brains while I consume media, I think. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually an excellent, excellent graphic novel. I absolutely love it. I'm really enjoying but, it. Yeah, I picked it up at the Lifeline Book Fair uh, at the end of last year um, for yeah. a few bucks. And it's, man, yeah, it's so well put together. It, it is, uh, um, and I, uh, I think it, it's one of those that, uh, yeah, the first time I read it, I was like you, I was reading it so carefully, like, oh, wow, wow, yeah. you know, really appreciating everything that he was doing, and then I, I, I've read it several times, and every time I read it, I, I get new things out of it, so, yeah, yeah, excellent, enjoy it, enjoy it, yeah. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you, you, you have a lot of creator-owned comics. And, and you've also developed uh, so, uh, and published some through Kickstarter um, yeah. and some with uh, Dark Horse and uh, with IDW. Yeah. How did you work it out? You know, when, when you start the project, do you plan, yeah, I'll send this one to a publisher or do you just think, no, I'm going to do it through Kickstarter? Well, where did you sit on this or how did you work it out? I usually have like a sort of 60 40 slate where like there's stuff I'm putting together where I'm like, Oh, I would need a publisher to like foot the bill for this or to help uh, produce it for four issues or like it's a pitch for a mini series or whatever. Um, so I, I, I sort of make those and start to like ship them into the world and see if they land. But having made comics too long enough, I know that your hit ratio or at least my hit ratio is, is, um, is a, a smaller percentage than 50. So you're gonna put in a lot of this effort and it's gonna sort of disappear and, and dissipate. And then when one hits, well, there goes like four to six months of my life. So it's kind of like a, a gamble. Whereas on the side of that, I love to just have things cooking where it's like, I'm gonna make it regardless. And so yeah. that was my sort of, that was how I started. Because when you, when you begin making comics, no publisher is really going to take much of a chance on you. And rightfully so. You're, you're nobody with no track record. So it's important to put things out. And the smartest thing I was told was, don't try and tell a 60-issue you know, story independently because it'll take you 30 years. And it's just not feasible. Tell a short story. And so I had editors at companies telling me, just tell like a five-page story. Tell a one-shot story. Keep it small. And so that's why I did Fatherhood as my very first sort of published comic. 
it's a 22 page story it's done and done in one and uh, you're set with it and it could become a really good calling card for me to edit this because they could see that i could write a whole story because writing a first issue is there's there's an easy element to it where you're just asking questions and you're just offering possibilities and that's really easy to do but the publisher won't know if you can ever do anything with those ideas so if you can tell a contained story that's cool and i love that i love short stories i love anthology tv shows i love all that sort of stuff yeah. so when i'm making comics i like to have like 40 percent of my slate just be these things that i could probably bankroll myself or i could probably take it to kickstarter and just get it done um, and that was why, because initially a Kickstarter was US only. And yeah. so once it became available for Australia, um, that was when I did my first Kickstarter, which was Dear Editor, which was like a goofy, a goofy idea that I turned into a fairly serious crime comic about the editor of a newspaper who's also a deer, like antlers. And yeah. so um, I sort of pitched it around to a few publishers that were where I had, I had connections with editors, but um, it was interesting. All of them were like, oh, I love that idea. And I'm like, cool, do you want to like publish it? And they're like, ah, I don't know what I'd do with it. I'm like, all right, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it clearly strikes a vein, but it, it might not be a money maker. So I was like, well, that's, that sounds like my brand. It'll strike a vein, but not make any money. So I, um, I got to work with Sammy Cavella, which I was really lucky to, uh, I, I met him through Ed Brisson, who was a mate of mine. And he, um, he'd met Sammy and then sort of passed Sammy's details on to yeah. me because Ed knew that I was looking for, for people to work with. And um, so Sammy and I put together this thing, but I thought, well, I don't want to try and start like issue one of, you know, six or 20 or whatever. So I just said, we'll just do one issue. We'll just make it a, a contained story. And so I took it to Kickstarter and it was so, so much fun. So much fun to do. Like it's stressful, don't get me wrong. But um, if, if, if you study and you look at other Kickstarter things and, um, there's a podcast called Comics Launch, um, mm -hmm. Comics with an X on the end. Um, that's by Tyler James. Uh, it's, 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 I think it's, uh, they're up to like 200 episodes full of just information about how to kickstart well. The guy is really smart on it. And so I'd, I'd sort of done like spreadsheets and, and notebooks of analysis and tried to work out how can I make this comic real and, and fund it. And we got there in the end, which was cool. So I, even though now I've worked with, you know, Dark Horse and Black Mask and, and all these other publishers, there's never any guarantee you'll work with them again. Yeah. But I feel like I can go to Kickstarter. I feel like I can put out weird, different, sized, or, I mean, the last, not the last comic, the, the previous comic I Kickstarter was Skyscraper, which we ended up doing as a, an oversized newspaper um, sized comic. And that was the sort of thing where no publisher is going to take that on board because it's a pain in the neck to print. Um, shops probably don't want to even shelve it because it'll sit weird or it'll have to be folded yeah. or whatever. And I was like, no, but that's how it, that, the story needs that space. And so we kickstarted it and it was my best launch ever at that time. And so um, it's nice to be able to experiment with the form and not necessarily need um permission to do it you can just do it yourself whereas another book i did which was eternal which the front cover is giant on my wall there um eric and i eric zavatsky the artist we were just going to kickstart it so we were like well let's go like european size and make it wider and we'll go oversized and we'll just just go crazy and we're like let's make it like because i initially wrote the script at like 24 pages and eric was like nah i'm gonna break it down and i'm gonna add some stuff to it and so then he made it like i think we ended up with like 50 odd pages and he just kept yeah. taking these scenes and branching them out which is amazing the dude is a master storyteller yeah. and so at the end of it i was like this is the sort of thing that like you couldn't make anywhere so we'll just kickstart it so eric worked on it in the background and then i was chatting to um matt pozzolo who runs black mask and he was like what are you working on and i said oh i've got this pitch and this pitch and 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 pozzolo had worked with eric and i was like oh eric and i are actually doing this thing for kickstarter it's a big funky oversized sort of graphic novella and he was like, oh, we'll, we'll take that on board if you want. We'll, we'll publish it. Yeah. And so that was one of the opportunities where doing something on my bugger this, I'm just going to make it pile, actually flipped over. Yeah. I found a publisher, which means we could do better print quality. We could get higher stock paper. We got the, 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 the print bounce fine. We got everything. And it was, um, it was in like the top 100 um, bestseller list for, for trades for the month of its release. So um it sort of spoke to me as a creator that you don't just have to do everything the one way initially i sort of thought 
you just got to keep pitching mini series to publishers until they pick them up and then you make them and you make five issues and then you make a trade and that's how you make comics that's not yeah. you can do whatever whatever you want which i kind of yeah. like no i i really appreciate that about you actually that you're you're trying and you're you're doing different things and really you know putting out different stuff like you know how ingenious to think of yeah i'm gonna do a comic and i'm gonna do it like a newspaper kind of thing you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's ingenious, just awesome maybe stupid, who knows? <laughs> no i think it's i mean you know for uh, for a librarian that's a nightmare that's a nightmare because th that's something <laughs> like how are we gonna have that at the library we can't have that sorry you know yeah. kind of thing it's uh, yeah but um uh as a fan and as a reader mm. i think that's really ingenious and you know i think it's it's great um yeah i came from like a reader standpoint where i was like if i walked around a comic convention and yeah. someone was selling it like a giant comic i'm there like and and somebody was ben hutchings down in victoria uh part of yeah. squish face studios he did walk to japan 10 years ago as a newspaper size thing and that's kind of the inspiration i've always loved that size and i've always wanted a project that i could do um dc also did wednesday comics which i thought was yeah. such a beautiful tactile experience and i kind of wanted that and yeah i knew it would be a nightmare for so many channels that i should be trying to aim my stuff through yeah. but i also just wanted to make something where i'd go oh, that's beautiful and so i i guess i think there's an element that i'm lucky that i'm not like trying to create freelance if i was trying to make a living um out of this i'm probably doing a really poor job of it um it would be it would be really difficult i sort of chase passion projects um it's 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 one of it's one of the things where i think it's in certain areas it's my downfall i can't just if somebody says to me do you want to make a st i mean I, I did a my little pony comic years yeah. ago it was like my second published comic because i was chatting with the editor at idw and i really wanted like you know ninja turtles or something that he did edit and he said oh no my slate's full but we could do my little pony and i was like well i'll give it a go i mean you, sh you shouldn't say no and i kept pitching ideas and they were all just not um fitting they just weren't for that property and eventually i was really lucky and i got one idea through and it ended up getting made and so he'd said do you want to pitch some more and i was like yeah sure and i kept pitching but i could never get something to stick um i don't think i'm great at doing that um that's sort of i guess the work for hire work where it's just like all right you have three days to come up with a supergirl pitch go i'm like ah i i, I don't know it's 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 definitely a failing of mine and it's interesting because i look at somebody like tom taylor down in victoria who's written near on every character at Marvel and DC at this stage um, in one panel or another. And I think if you just said to him, we just need a juggernaut story, he would sort of sit for a day and he'd come back with this amazing take. I think his brain is phenomenal at doing that and yeah. taking the craziest ideas. Like we basically want Marvel zombies within the DC universe. And he's like, cool, I'm going to make it amazing. And you're like, oh, how? <laughs> and I don't think I could do that but I can do these weird non-profit passion projects, yeah. but that spark a fire for me on, on a craft level or something like that. Yeah. The annoying thing about Taylor though, is he can do the, the superhero stuff and work for her and he can do the really good comics. He's kind of got both uh, weapons at his disposal. Whereas I feel like my leaning is definitely more just on that side. I don't think I'm ever going to be prolific, but I think everything I put out is going to be personal, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, um, yeah, that, that's a good thing. And talking about personal and your own projects, um, uh, you know, so the big Kickstarter that you just closed the, uh, is yes. for uh, She, that's yes. the title. Uh, yeah, you know, you wanna, so congratulations, first thing, you know, because it was a very successful Kickstarter. It's uh, huge, you wanna, yeah. Yeah, you want to tell us a bit about the project and... Um, yeah, yeah, she is, um, it's, a, it's a, a sort of graphic novella about an intergalactic bounty hunter. Um, and so it's sort of like big sci-fi outer space story, but it's about her dealing with um, loss and sort of trying to protect the secret. And she gets into a situation where um, that's going to be very difficult. And so I won't spoil the rest of the story, but that's kind of the setup. And um, it's, it's a really fun like character and world to build and um i got to partner with chris panda on art 
I really like his visual. Somebody on on line recently said his work reminds them of um Mike Allred and Laura Allred's work. And I was like, oh yeah, I can definitely see that similarity. His faces are really, really clean, but really still evocative. And um, so yeah, we put this this book together and then um, we had our pitch ready and we took it to Comics Tribe um, where uh, Tyler James is the publisher. And he's such a smart guy with the Kickstarter platform. And I've known him now for near on seven, eight years. So he's a good mate. And this was the project where he looked at it and he was not only like, yeah, I love it, but he was like, I've got an idea. And I think that's where our Kickstarter success came from because he came up with the idea to make it hardcover and then the cover would have the die cut opening. So he was like, and it was all his idea. He's like, why don't we have it as a headshot of the character? Because when she wears her like spacesuit, she has this like skull mask that sits over. He was like, why don't we have it that that's what she looks like? And then you open the cover and the helmet comes away and there's like a vellum with the face mask on it. And then you peel that back and then you just have her head on the first sheet. And it just looks so gorgeous. And it was right up my alley because it's one of those things where it's like, you're getting a comic, but you're also getting this like, this totemic thing to hold and to own. And I love doing that. Eternal was something that I wanted to do that. Skyscraper was something where I wanted to do that. And so for this, I was like, yeah, I mean, if you can figure out a way to do it, let's do it. And so Tyler was like, all right, he loves the challenge. And he did, he was like working with printers and he was trying to work out is, is this possible? And is it affordable? And he eventually sort of figured out this perfect thing. He then sort of like took the idea to Chris, the artist, and Chris instantly was just like, here's how I would lay it out. And Chris actually had like a GIF that showed you the layers. And I'm just sitting here in my little office like, whoa, this is all way outside my <laughs> scope. I couldn't create anything like this. I didn't even think of anything like this. And so watching it all come together before we launched was really, really cool. Um, so yeah, I can't wait to like get my hands on this, like this nice hardcover volume of this story that, you know, I wrote a while ago and Chris and I have been working on it for like a year before we took it to Kickstarter. Um, but it sort of showed me, you know, that it's a really, it's a really good avenue for still making, um, making really cool comics that aren't just like disposable single issues that sort of, you know, get trunked or in the long box, but you know, people, will, well, and uh, people did, people supported this cause they were like, man, it looks so gorgeous. And I'm like, yeah, I, I agree. And that's, that's none of my influence. It's all the artists and the public. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, I, I can't wait to have it <laughs> in my hands as well. So obviously I nice. backed it as well. And yeah, I can't wait to, to receive this volume. I think, yeah, yeah, it looks awesome. It looks really good. Actually, one, th one thing that I thought is that um, uh, with this project and some of your other projects, I feel like uh, maybe there's a bit of a European uh, comics influence Am I right, or do you read the European comics? Or? I, I I like the idea of yeah, doing like like in Europe they have the albums, and you yeah. just have the, the, like the, the the graphic novel sort of volumes. And um, I mean, I've always kind of liked that that method. I, I like a I like a, a story that ends. I like a story where I can see all the pieces, and you 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 get that in superhero comics, let's say, because they're like the, the big ongoing perennial second act thing. You get your arcs that that add up to something, but it always leads on to something else. And there's always this sort of tumble drive flow. But I love like a really tight, like um speaking of like City of Glass and Mazzucelli, like a serious polyp where it's like it's just this one thing that's just it's all encompassing and it's just there. And you can publish it a different way. Um, and recently there's been like uh, Brubaker and Phillips have been putting out stuff like My Heroes Have Always Been Junkies um, and they're doing Pulp. Well, they, Pulp was meant to come out next month. Who knows when it'll come out now. Um, I, like, I like being able to pick stuff up like that. And especially I, I always think from an Australian point of view, I love conventions and I love finding new stuff. And it's nice when you can buy something and it's, it's all complete rather than going and buying issue one and two, and then you don't know when you're gonna see that creator again, and you don't know when they're gonna finish it, and then eventually you see them at a convention in Sydney, and you're like, oh, did I need issue three or just four? Or are you trying to piece it together? But just to be able to pick up this like volume and then sit it on the shelf, I will admit, I love a good shelf. Um, that, that is definitely a cool way to do it. And yeah, I went to Europe in 2015, was it? And I did, I was just going to like comic shops over there and just checking things out, which is cool because I don't speak any other language than English. So I'm picking up all of these comics where I'm like, oh, I wonder like, 
what it'll look like inside. And I wonder what the story is. And I ended up buying a few different things. And it was cool to like buy. There was one um, uh, Klaus and Simon. It was a Spanish comic. And I believe there's a few series of volumes, but I can't read it in the slightest because it's in Spanish, but you can flip through it. And comics are great. You can kind of read a comic without reading the words and get what's going on. And it's this amazing comic. And it's nice to just have something where I'm like, yeah, all right. I, I, I now have this thing. Like, it's still like, people go to cities and they buy postcards or they buy spoons or whatever. I buy comics. And so I try to find something local. And I think that was a fairly decent influence where I was like, well, if I'm going to tell these like one shot stories, like I did with my first comic fatherhood, why don't I do it? But just on a bit of a bigger scale. The only problem there is, can you find an artist to walk with you at that size? But when you do, and I've been really lucky to find people that are really happy to jam on this sort of stuff. It's cool to have like, something at the end of it that you feel like is tactile and matters you know yeah um yeah for me i i grew up in europe so for me um no. yeah i grew up with um obviously i did read american comics uh but yeah. um i read lots of european comics and i really um yeah i really like that you know how it's it's one volume it's self-contained and then mm. you know if you read all the volumes very often there is kind of some sort of larger yeah. story in the background kind of thing but you can read them as standalone stories and um i really 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 appreciate that uh anyway um to finish i thought i'd ask about three comics or graphic novels that you've read recently so if, if you yeah, want to um, share something that you've read and yeah, definitely. I've got I've got three suggestions. They're all kind of standalone things, which is really funny. Um, one is um, Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me, which strange enough, I actually have on the shelf here. Um, this comic is insanely good. It was one of those comics where I'd heard the hype for it, and I was like, Nah, can't be. It can't be that good, surely. And then I read it and was like, Wow, it really, really, really is that good. Um, and it's just like a, a standalone graphic novel and it's just about this girl in high school and she's in love with this Laura Dean girl and they, they, their relationship is just like a teenage relationship. And it's, it's so emotionally true and the comic crafting on the page is so strong. I absolutely loved it. So that's, that's definitely one. Another is um, November, which was written by Matt Fraction and illustrated by um, Elsa Charatier, who is a French artist. And it's, a, it's like a single volume crime story, but they're actually going to make volumes two and three and then there'll be this larger interconnecting thing. Um, but this first volume is just really, really well put together. Um, it sort of, it, it uses like grids and page panel breakdown really well. And it's a very fractured narrative. And it's the sort of thing where, and I love doing this myself as a creator, you have to read it more than once. Like you want it to like, you want people to, like when people read, I oh no. Is that? Oh, no, there's something on my screen just glitched. Um, when I did Skyscraper, um, people sort of said to me, this is great, but I had to read it again. And I'm like, yeah, cool. No, I'm fine with that. Like, that, 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 that wasn't a design flaw, I hope. Um, that was something where I was like, no, I want people to have to delve into these things. So November is definitely something like that. And that came out through Image last year. So I definitely think people should check that out. Um, and the other one I was looking at was um, an, a, a, an Australian one called... Um, Cracks in the Walls, and it's by Tatiana Davidson, who's a Victorian creator, and um, all of her work's phenomenal, and this is sort of like an anthology book of some short stories that she made, and she is just an absolute master when it comes to, like, creepy comics and sort of, like, horrifying icky concepts. Her artwork's so beautiful, and her pacing and control on the page is, is so masterful. Um, she's, she's someone that I met at a convention years ago and just fell in love with her work. Um, and she's made other things since uh, she did last year, uh, a visit from Midnight Mummy, which is also really, really creepy. Um, but you can find most of her. In fact, I think you can find all of her stuff on ownerindie.com, um, which is like the Australian, uh, independent comics creators hub for us selling our stuff. So if you look for Tatiana Davidson there or cracks in the walls, you'll find that. And it is um it's like one of my favorite australian comics it's it's so good excellent i i actually didn't know about her so uh, i'll definitely look her up um yeah yeah check it out it's 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 all amazing 
what, when was uh, that one published? That was probably put out about three years ago. I'm going to okay. roughly estimate. Um, and then she did Coney's Best Cuts the next year. And then she did a visit from Midnight Mummy last year. Um, Cracks in the Walls is good because it has the Blackfish story. She sells Blackfish as a separate little sort of mini comic, but it has Blackfish in there. Um, and Blackfish is just one of the best short comics I've ever read. Just like hands down ever. It's so good. Um, yeah, she's one of those creators where I'm like, man, I'd love to work with her, but I also know she doesn't need me in the slightest. Her work is so strong and her authorial voice is so well meted out through like the tone that she wants to sort of hit. Um, yeah, if I'm ever at a convention, um, like she's one of those things where I just sort of instantly buy whatever's new. Whereas normally, you know, a convention's a big place and you take your time and you like budget in your head. Yeah. I know she's going to fit the budget. So I just buy it straight away just so that I can sort of um, usually show other people and say like, you've got to go check this out. So yeah, definitely check her stuff out online. That's cool. Um, excellent. So w where can we find your comics? And what's the best way to get them? Yeah, if, um, if people are looking to purchase any of my stuff, uh, Ona Indie, so it's O-W-N-A-I-N-D-I dot com, Ona Indie um, dot com, and then I think it's a slash Ryan K. Lindsay uh, will take you to my comics, but by all means, browse around through all the other Australian comics that are there from Tatiana and um, Gestalt Publishing and Ben Mitchell and, and lots of other awesome creators. Um, and, and they can find me online in most places as Ryan K. Lindsay, so whether it's like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Ryan K. Lindsay will generally take you to the space. No worries. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Ryan. Um, yeah, you know, and especially during the holidays, um, yeah. preparing for remote learning. Yes, yes, I've got some more uh, maths lessons to put together later. <laughs> yeah, and I imagine you also have some work to do also with she. Yes, yeah, I was doing some background stuff on it last night, so. Yeah. We'll, we'll continue getting everything ready for us to be able to then push it out into the world. We can't wait. Excellent. I can't wait to get that um, hardcover, beautiful volume that you've put together. Well, that's awesome, man. Thanks for supporting it. I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Take care and stay safe. Will do. Cheers, man. Thanks. Bye.